a formal welcome to Daily Power Parsha, our informal look at the daily section of the Parsha. You see what I did there? Formally welcome you to an informal class, although it is a formal class. So this week we begin the Torah portion of Tetzaveh in the book of Exodus. We're still in the same book. Don't worry, we're still, we're still comfortably in book number two. And the conversation continues about the building of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the first temple, if you will, portable temple, sanctuary for God. And the focus this week is going to be on the construction of the various priestly garments that were worn by those who performed the service in said tabernacle. So let's go through it. We're going to begin with a verse that has so many layers of meaning, and uh, this should be a lot of fun. So I'm going to share my screen with you, and we are going to jump right in. This is Exodus, right, Tetzave, the Torah portion, Exodus chapter 27, beginning with verse number 20. This is God still speaking to Moses about what to tell the people about what to do what to give, what to make for this project. So this is still the command from God to Moses. And you shall command, God says to Moses, and you, Moses, shall command the children of Israel, and they shall take to you pure olive oil. Right. This is another item that's needed for the temple service. Remember we spoke last week about the menorah? Right. You have this beautiful golden candelabra. Well, it's not going to light itself. As I like to ask my kids, why do we light the menorah on Hanukkah? because it can't light itself, right? Obviously, that's why we light it. But you can't light the menorah without your oil, without your fuel. So they should bring to you, says God, pure olive oil crushed for lighting. That means that the oil is pressed, right? To kindle the lamps continually. All right, so there's a lot to unpack in this verse, but let's do the next one and then we'll come back. In the, tent of, in the tent of meeting, outside the dividing curtain that is in front of the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall set it up before the Lord from evening to morning. It shall be an everlasting statue for their generations from the children of Israel. This is really important. Where is the menorah lit? It's inside the tent of meeting. That's what we spoke about last week. Remember, the tabernacle, the Mishkan, had an outer courtyard surrounded by a perimeter wall. But then inside, at some point inside that larger space was the actual edifice, the building of the temple or the Mishkan, the tabernacle, which is called in, in Torah very often the tent of meeting, right? The, Steve, no, the tent of meeting is the space that was, you know, covered and had the holy items inside of it. It's not in the holy of holies. It's outside. The menorah is, no, it's outside that dividing curtain. That is in front in the front of the in, in front of the testimony. In other words, it's not inside the Holy of Holies with the, the testimony, i.e., the Ark of the Testimony. No, it's outside that curtain. That is where Aaron and his sons, the priests, shall set it up and kindle the menorah from evening to morning. This is really important. They lit the menorah in the afternoon toward evening, and it stayed lit until the next morning. And this is an everlasting statute. This is a mitzvah that is for all generations. And you might be wondering, I'll just jump in with this one comment. There's a lot, I have a lot of stuff to say, but let me just mention something about this. It says, this shall be an everlasting statute for their generations. In other words, this is a mitzvah, kindling the menorah that's meant to be done in every generation. Well, here's the problem. We don't have a temple. And if we don't have a temple, we can't do the temple menorah service. So why is the Torah, why does God say it's an everlasting statute for their generations, in other words, for all time, the sages tell us that we do, in a sense, on some level, replicate this mitzvah, not perfectly, but somehow there is a replica. And of course, you probably know what I'm referring to. It is the story of Hanukkah and the holiday of Hanukkah each year. So although it's not at all the temple menorah, it's a different menorah, different number of lamps, different, you know, everything is not everybody. I mean, it's fundamentally different, but there is some sort of a semblance of this mitzvah or of this observance that is done throughout the generations till this very day on Hanukkah, we too light a menorah, not in the temple, not by the priests, not seven lamps, but menorahs are lit with oil. 
I need to share with you, um, I guess, a big idea. This is a really big idea. From the moment that the book of Exodus begins until the end of the Torah. So from book two, the beginning of book two, through book five of the five books, there is a central character whose name is mentioned in every single Torah portion. Can you tell me, trivia question, can you tell me which biblical character, Jewish hero, leader, is mentioned in every single Torah portion from the beginning of Exodus through the end of Torah? Who is mentioned in every Torah portion? Hold on, unmute. Who's going to buzz in? Looks like, Ray, you got it. I don't know. Moshe? Moshe, correct. You are correct. You get 10 Torah bucks points <laughs> for today's quiz. I'm kidding. Right? So Moshe, Moses' name is mentioned in every single Torah portion from the beginning of Exodus where we read about his birth until his passing at the end of Deuteronomy with one exception. The one exception is this week's Torah portion. Not once is Moses' name mentioned. Again, I need to repeat this because this is crazy. There's only one Torah portion oh, oh. from the moment that we read about his birth until the end of Torah because where we read not... about his death, that Moshe's name is not mentioned. And that is this week's Torah portion, the Torah portion of Titzaveh. Titzaveh has not one mention of the word name Moshe. The question is why? It's very bizarre. It's very strange. I'm going to give you the simple reason, and then I'm going to give you the Kabbalistic reason. The simple reason, which is not so simple, is as follows. Next week's Torah portion. We're going, spoiler alert, we're going to read about the sin of the golden calf. Remember that sin, right? After Sinai, the Jews worshiped the golden calf, and they were, God wasn't happy, and there was punishment, etc. But while initially God was unhappy, God tells Moses, my intention is to completely destroy, God forbid, the entire Jewish people and to only leave you surviving, alive, and I, re I, I will rebuild the nation from you. And Moses turns to God and says, no deal, no dice. If that's a phrase, right? No deal. Not going to do that, right? I am not signing off on you taking out the Jewish people and starting again for me, very flattered, not going to happen. In fact, Moses tells God, Moses gives God an ultimatum. He says, either you forgive the Jewish people or take me, erase my name from the entire Torah. In other words, I don't want to have anything to do with a Torah, with a law that is so unforgiving and inflexible that it cannot allow space for the idea of teshuva, the idea of repairing what was broken. Moses says, if that's the case, if this Torah, if this law is so inflexible, so not understanding, so you know, um, idealistic that it can't handle a little golden calf action and forgiveness, then I'm out. God relents and God says, all right, deal, I'll forgive them. And all is more or less restored. Our sages tell us that when a tzaddik says something, when a tzaddik utters words, even if it's conditional, it has to take root. It has to have some sort of tangible effect in the universe. And so when Moses says, erase my name from Torah, if you don't forgive, the very fact that he said, that, said those words, erase my name from Torah, means that it had to have some sort of effect. That from one Torah portion, his name had to be absent. Remember, this episode happens next week's Torah portion. So it says that God was thinking, okay, which Torah portion, for the token fulfillment of his words, which Torah portion should Moses' name be missing? So he started with that one, the, the next week's portion where it happened. No, we need him there. We need him there. We need him there. God made a full loop circle, came back around to the portion right before then and said, well, I guess this is the last one, last chance to take him out. That's why Moses' name is missing from Tetzaveh, 
the portion right before Kisisa next week, where we read about the sin of the golden calf and those words, those epic words from Moses, erase my name from the book that you've, that you've written. Does that make sense? Yes? So Moses says those words, erase my name from Torah. It was part of a larger condition or ultimatum, either forgive or erase. And although God did forgive, since he did say the words, erase my name from Torah, and a tzaddik that utters words, it has an effect. It has an effect. Full circle, this week's Torah portion, Moses' name is not mentioned. That's the classic understanding of why Moses' name is not mentioned. Again, it's so bizarre because literally, literally the whole portion is God speaking to Moses. And yet his name is not mentioned. Let's get to the mystical understanding. You ready? If you thought that was wild, buckle up, put on the goggles, and make sure there's a roll cage on this thing because this is about to get hectic. All right, you ready? I'm going to share my screen with you one more, one more time and show you the opening verse of the Parsha. Take a look at the opening verse. This is God speaking to Moses. God says, and you shall command the children of Israel. Who is the you? Who is the you? God is speaking. Who's you? Who you? Moses, right? Moshe, right? God says to Moshe, and you shall command. In fact, in the Hebrew, it's the first word, ve'ata. Ve'ata means and you. Ve'ata, and you. So God doesn't address Moses by name. But you know what the Kabbalists say? He addresses him even more directly than name. You see, a name is not the essence of the human being. You and I could exist without a name. It would be a little bit weird. Uh, it would be a little bit confusing sometimes. Hey, you, right? It's more efficient to have a name. It's helpful to have a name. But a name is like a tag. It's like a label. It's, a, it's kind of an aftermarket edition, right? It's we are who we are. And then we have a name. If we were alone in a desert island and to no one to call us, right, only a, a volleyball, right, Wilson, then um, would we actually need a name? The answer is no, we wouldn't need a name. So a name is actually not representative of a person's essence. So every time the Torah says the word Moses, it's not his true essence. But where is the true essence? You. The word va'ata and you is a more direct communication than the verses that usually say in the structure, and God spoke to Moses saying. That's a little bit more detached than God saying, speaking directly to Moses and the Torah relaying that by saying, and God said, you, Moses, or just starting off right there, and you shall command the children of Israel, God directing his message straight to Moses you, not Moses, you. The Rebbe says the following. Why is this Torah portion the one where there's no name? Why is it direct, which we think is an absence of Moses, but really represents his strongest presence, you, which is stronger than a name? It's not like Moses is really absent. Moses is more present than any other portion that just says his name. And every other portion just says his name. This one is you directly to Moses, to the essence of who he is. Why? Because his stance about the golden calf, his ultimatum, his, his ultimatum represents the true essence of who he was and the true essence of a leader. A true leader puts their own self on the line for the other. When Moses says to God, next week's Torah portion, here's your choice, God. To God, I mean, talk about Jewish chutzpah, right? To God, he says, Forgive the people or take me out of Torah. That is the ultimate embodiment, the ultimate display of Moses' true essence. And so when it comes full circle, 52 portions later, and we get back to Tetzava, or 53 portions later, back to Tetzava, the, the portion before that ultimatum, Moses' name on the surface is missing, but Moses is not missing because that represents his true essence, the essence of a leader. 
is not getting in the way, is not making it about themselves and about their own name and their own fame, because that's what God was offering Moses. I'll rebuild the nation from you. And Moses says, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about the people. So Moses, his name being absent is, is symbolic of his essence being present. I hope that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yes. Thumbs up ish. Okay. Let's continue inside. Let's get into the, uh, the, Mark, the quick question. Yeah, Mark, go ahead. Uh, isn't it true that am I wrong in the Haggadah? Is God is Moses' name not mentioned or someone? Correct. You are correct. His name is very, very scantily. That's the word, right? Very um, not present. There is one reference in passing, but it's not a reference to Mo. It's it mentions Moses' name, but it's a verse. It says that the Jewish people, after the splitting of the sea, they believed in God and in Moses' his servant. But it's kind of like a verse that mentions Moses, but not the actual Haggadah that talks about. And you know what happened next? Moses went to Pharaoh. We don't. That's not part of the story. Or that's not part of the narrative on the night of Passover. It's just about God and the miracles that God did. There are different opinions as to why that's the case. The classic answer is because we don't want to in any way, shape, or form, deify Moses, right, for all time. We don't want it to be like, this is the Moses show, um, out of fear that Moses could be elevated to that godlike position. That's a classic answer that's given. Is it the Hasidic answer? No, it would be more along the lines of what you're saying, is that maybe in his absence, he's even more present because the whole story is about, about him without even mentioning his name, something along those lines. Although here, this portion begins with the word va'ata and you, which is a direct, it's not about Moses, it's direct to his essence. It's directly addressing him. And by the way, we're up to we're up to now, chapter 20, verse 1. Again, va'ata. Again, you and you, God says directly to Moses. There's a clear and deliberate avoidance of using his name, but the flip side is it's directed, it's directly addressing his essence. All right, let's talk about the next mitzvah or instruction and you bring near to yourself your brother Aaron and his sons with him from among the children of Israel to serve me as Kohan okay so this is like a general um, instruction right who are who are going to be the ones to serve in this Mishkan in the tabernacle temple space Aaron your brother and his sons they will be the Kohan and who what are their names so Aaron, the father, well, the Moses' brother, but the father of these kids, Nadab, and Abihu, Elazar, and Itamar. So Aaron and his four sons. Those will be the ones to serve in the Mishkan. Now, now that they've been appointed, well, they haven't been appointed yet. God is saying that you should appoint them. But once they're appointed, they're going to need something to wear. What are they going to show up to the Mishkan, the official Kohanim, of the Mishkan, the official priest doing the service, they're going to show up, what, in jeans and a t-shirt? Come on. What is this? An apple lunch? What do you mean? So they have to wear something that's um, that's 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 holy. So verse 2, you shall make holy garments for your brother Aaron for honor and glory. So here we have an indication that garments, although one could say they're only garments, so why is that significant? It's only clothing. Nonetheless, there is an element of honor and glory that is expressed and or articulated by the clothes that we wear. So do we make the clothes or do the clothes make us? It's a little bit of a combination of both. Because they're Kohanim, they shall wear special clothes. And because they're wearing special clothes, it will act as honor and glory for them. So it really works both ways. Let's continue. And you shall speak to all the wise hearted whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom. In other words, get very skilled people, workers, and they shall make Aaron's garments, weavers or whatever, garment makers, and they shall make Aaron's garments to sanctify him so that he serve me as a coin. So who should make the garments? All the wise hearted who God has filled with the spirit of wisdom. In other words, it's going to be a little complicated. It's going to be a little bit challenging to make these garments per spec, 
you know, the specs that I'm going to share with you. So therefore, you have to find people that are chach melev, wise-hearted, um, which I remember is one of the first things that we did in DPP a year ago or so. We spoke about chach melev, the wise-hearted. So we have the idea of wisdom, which is typically in the brain, and heart, which is not the brain. And yet they're combined as one, chach melev, wise-hearted or wise of heart. The heart is not usually wise. The, the heart is usually emotive. So what's the deal with the wise-hearted? The idea is that to create these garments, you need a person that has both a, uh, a, a mind that's where it needs to be and also a heart where it needs to be. Wise-hearted, the balance of both uh, energies. Let's continue. These are the garments that they shall make. So all of these wise-hearted garment makers shall make the following garments. You ready? Here we go. Echoshen, right? The Choshen, as we know, especially from our jewelry making workshop a few months ago, the Choshen is the breastplate, is that plate that had the stones in it that the high priest wore. So the Choshen, an aphod, which is like a, um, the aphod is uh, like an apron type thing a robe, a tunic of checker work, a cap, and a sash. So those are the garments. They shall make holy garments for your brother Aaron and for his sons to serve me as Kohanim. Now, what's interesting is, is that the regular Kohanim would wear four garments. And the high priest would wear eight garments. So as this portion rolls forward, we're going to get all the details of all of the items of all these garments. So let's continue inside. Now, what materials are these made out of? They shall take the gold, the blue and purple and crimson wool, and the linen. Now, what does it mean, the gold, the blue, purple and crimson wool, and the linen? What does it mean, the? What are we talking about? Last week's Torah portion came the opening command of the list of items, the supply list. And part of the supplies were gold, blue, purple, and crimson wool and linen. And so now God is saying, remember I gave you the supply list? This is what it's for, right? This is what we need it for now, for these garments. And they shall make, verse 6, and they shall make the aphod. They shall make this aphod, this apron aphod of gold, blue, purple, and crimson wool and twisted fine linen, the work of a master weaver. What's interesting and I think I mentioned this last week, is that in this garment, there is a, there's a mixture of wool and linen, right? Wool and linen, which is prohibited by Torah. But again, as I said last week, the same Torah that prohibits it for um, casual use, mundane use, obligates it for Kohanic use. So the layperson is not allowed to wear a garment of wool and linen, but the priests had to wear garments made of wool and linen. That was the rule. Maybe one could argue that we're not supposed to wear wool and linen because it was reserved exclusively. You know, that beautiful mixture was reserved exclusively for the priests, perhaps. Ultimately, we don't know the reason. But again, just notice that this is wool and linen mixed together. Now, this apron type thing shall have two connected shoulder straps at both its ends. And it shall be entirely connected. And its decorative band, which is above it, shall be of the same work emanating from it, gold, blue, purple, and crimson wool, and twisted fine linen. Okay? So we have here kind of like um, an apron with shoulder straps and um, a decorative band. And take a look at this, verse 9. And you shall take two shoham stones, and engrave upon them the names of the sons of Israel. So there were two stones that were on these shoulder straps. Um, they were called shoham stones. Now, what is a shoham stone? Well, Donna did a lot of research. We actually, I think we, uh, we I did some research. Donna did research. And Donna, are you able to unmute yourself? Possibly, maybe not. Yes, oh, yeah. I found, found out it was... Sardonyx. And what color is that? It's like 
it's primarily black. But right. what differentiates itself from pure black onyx is that it had a more of a marbling effect, like kind of a little bit of cream kind of swirling through very, very uh, faint. But that's what differentiates it from pure black onyx right. is that it was a little more, you know, subtle, a little more distinctive. Right. Okay, good. And we had, when we did the, the, the Hoshen um, jewelry workshop, we had that stone, didn't we? Or we did not? I'm trying to remember. Yes, we did have the stone. And the, have that yeah. stone was emanated from Israel. So it was very often, I mean, not the particular one that I used, but the variety of it, it was, it was very authentic from the time. Right. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. So yeah, I, I, I recalled that, but I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, mention anything that was not correct. And, and you definitely did the, uh, did the heavy research on that. So these yeah. are two Shoham stones and they were again, darker color on the shoulder straps and they were engraved and on them were engraved the names of the sons of Israel. Now that means literally the sons of Israel, i.e. the 12 tribes, 12 sons, 12 tribes. Now you have two stones and 12 names. How do you, div how do you divide them? You guessed it. Verse 10, six of their names on one stone and the names of the remaining six on the second stone. See, you can learn math from Torah, right? Two stones, 12 names, carry the three. No, six and six, right? Division, multiplication, subtraction. And yeah, all that stuff right here. Right, so six on one, six on the other, according to their births. In other words, in the order of their births. Similar, verse 11, similar to the work of an engraver of gems, similar to the engravings of a seal. Um, not that type of seal, but like, right? Not sea world, sea world seals. This is a seal of, uh, you know, a seal. You shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall make them enclosed in gold settings. Look at that. So you have these, um, you have these dark stones with a little bit of marbleized cream in it, and they are enclosed in gold settings. Really beautiful. And you shall put the two stones with the engraved names upon the shoulder straps of the aphod, as I mentioned before, as stones of remembrance. Look at that. What's their function? Avne zikaron, you know, like the word yiskar. It's stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall carry their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders as a remembrance. Stones of remembrance as the high priest serves in the temple or in the tabernacle, as he walks through those holy spaces, he's not just walking as an individual. He's carrying the names of the 12 tribes upon his shoulders. That represents his role. It represents God's desire as a leader. It's not about you. As we said before, as we've said many times, countless times, you are carrying on your shoulders the people. You represent others. Never forget that. Also, the idea of stones of remembrance. So stones of remembrance for him to remember why he's there, what his purpose is, what his role is, what his responsibility is. Number one. Number two, stones of remembrance to, not that God needs a reminder, but to evoke the, the um, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Evoke the merit of the Jewish people before God constantly, right? Wherever the priest go, high priest goes, he's always evoking the, the memory of the Jewish people, the 12 tribes for good. All right, let's jump into our second reading. All right, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment, and um, I want to see if I can find something. Um, give me a second. All right, quick, quick thing to add. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Jump in. Yeah, Rashi says there were 25 uh, letters on each stone. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So if the 12 tribes ultimately netted, if you will, 25 letters total. Well, you know, when you do engraving and they give you like, like one to 25 letters is a certain price. And then over 25 letters is way more expensive. So they're like, okay, listen, here's what we're going to do. 
we're going to limit this to 25 letters because who has, I mean, who has that kind of money? 26 letters and it's another 25 bucks. Like that's not happening. Not, not on my watch, says Moses. All right, let's, um, right, all joking aside. I'm looking up, I want to find you guys a good picture of the AFOD. Um, why don't I just do this? Boom, shakalaka. Um, uh, is this what I want even? I don't know. Um, yeah. Are you have some pictures? Do you want me to show them? Yeah, but it's going to be hard. I feel like this is going to be an easier way. Okay. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I do in theory, but I, but I just know that on Zoom, it like everyone has to like squint in. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna share a screen of an of an image. Is it the image, the ultimate image? No, but I believe it's the one that Donna used as well in the um, in the uh, the handout materials for the Khoshan. So you see it there. A little bit of an eight foot action, right? There's a little bit of a thing. I don't see the stones in the shoulder. Whatever. Maybe it's a bit of an artistic rendering of such, but nonetheless. All right. Let's get back to our our, our parsha. This is the second reading, Exodus chapter 28, verse number 13. Let's do this. All right. This is for today, for Monday. You shall make settings of gold. Settings of gold. Yes, that's where the stones are going to be. And two chains of pure gold, you will make them attached to the edges after the manner of cables, and you will place the cable chains upon the settings. You could tell this is an older um, instruction. It's a bit of an older process because they're still using cable. Nowadays, people have cut the cord, you know, who has cable anyway, but back then there was, guys, listen, if my jokes are too corny and really not working, just let me know. I don't mind pulling back on this stuff. All right. So we have settings of gold. We have attached with cables and chains. Let's continue. You shall make, and this is what lies above the aphod apron. This is what lies above that. You shall make a choshen of judgment. Now the choshen is the breastplate. Why is it called the Choshen of Judgment? Well, let me just jump in right now. And this is something we discussed a few months ago when we did that workshop. When, when there was a case, when there was a big question that came in front of the high priest, so he was able to consult with God and the actual stones, the gems of the breastplate lit up and provided the answer to the legal question. So this is why one of the reasons why it's called the Choshen of Judgment because it did offer some sort of... some form of some sort of miraculous judgment in certain circumstances. So this is the Choshen. It's the work of a master weaver. So you needed someone who really knew what they were doing to make this. You shall make it like the work of the aphode, similar color scheme, gold, blue, purple, and crimson wool, and twisted fine linen shall you make it, or of gold, right? Of this stuff, you shall make it, So or shall you make it? So it's ma made of the same materials, the same core items as the apron beneath it. It shall be square. It shall be square and doubled. That means is it's a square, but but it's folded. So it it, it rests as a, it's when it's folded, it looks like a square, but it could actually be opened up. Now inside of that, according to the commentaries, was a special name of God inside that was folded inside that square. Its length, one span, and its width, one span. So it was the same amount. It was a perfect square when it was folded. Now, it was meant to have, as we saw at the, at the top, settings of gold inside this choshen. So you shall fill it, you shall fill into it stone fillings, four rows of stones. I reference back to this image, four rows of stones, right? Three, 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 and a perfectly square breastplate. Now, what stones should be there? So the Torah actually tells us the actual stones that were meant to be placed in the Choshen. So row number one was Odem, Pitida, and Bereket. Thus shall be the one, thus shall the one row be. Second row, these are all names of gemstones. Second row, Nofech, Sapir. If you think that sounds like sapphire, you win the prize. Yes, Sapir. And Yahalom. All right, row number three, 
Leshem, Shivo, and Achlama. Fourth row, Tarshish, Shoham, and Yashbe. They shall be set in gold in their filling. So 12 gems, 12 stones, four rows, 12 gold settings. Now, I want you to appreciate the challenge that we had, that mainly Donna gave this challenge to a few months ago, when we were creating the jewelry to symbolize the Choshen, right? Because honestly, if you're going to a gem source and asking for, I don't need a lot. I just need some Odem, Pitta, Bereket, Nofech, Sapir, Yalom, Leshem, Shavu, Achlama, Tarshish, Shoham, and Yashpe. You know, give me like, give me a few sets of those. A few dozen sets of those. They're going to say, what you talking about? Right. So the commentaries, both ancient and modern, are dealing with the question, well, what stones were they? What precise stones were they? Like, what what do these mean? And there's a variance. There's a variation of commentary about what these stones actually were, what colors they were. And you can look up any number of commentaries and you'll find different, completely different notions of what the stones were. What we did. And again, Donna did, did the heavy lifting on this. What we did was a lot of research on it to try to find what the most common understandings were and or within a range and maybe a preference toward some of the, um, the Chabad, you know, uh, preferred commentaries. But amongst the commentaries, there are many, many versions, but there are, um, these, these are the 12 stones. Let's continue back inside verse 21. And the stone shall be for the names of the sons of Israel, 12, right? So 12 sons of Israel, 12 tribes, 12 stones. So one stone, the 12 stones, 12 names corresponding to their names. You see that? In other words, one stone per name, per tribe. Similar to the engravings of a seal, everyone according to his name shall they be for the 12 tribes. Which means that on each of the stones was engraved one of the 12 tribes. Does that make sense? Each stone, in addition to the two on the shoulder that had six and six, 25 characters or less, sounds like Twitter, right? So you had each stone had one of the tribes engraved on it. Let's continue back inside verse 22. You shall make for the Choshen chains at the edges of cable work of pure gold. You shall make for the Choshen two golden rings and you shall place the two rings on the two ends of the Choshen. Let's see if this has the rings. Uh, yeah, you see at the top edges of this Choshen, there are rings that are ultimately attached to a chain. Underneath it would be that aphod um, shoulder strap. The stone is not there, but we have to use our imagination for some of those things. Let's continue. You shall place, I don't even know what I'm up to. Yeah, verse 24. And you shall place the golden, sorry, the two golden cables on the two rings at the ends of the Choshen. That's what we saw here, where the cables, the golden chains, are attached to the rings that are attached to that breastplate. Let's continue. At the ends, sorry, and the two ends of the two cables you shall place upon the two settings, and these you shall place upon the shoulder straps of the aphod on its front part. You shall make two golden rings, and you shall place them on the two ends of the Choshen, on the edge that is toward the inner side of the aphod. And you shall make two golden rings and place them on the two shoulder straps of the aphor from below toward its front, adjacent to its seam above the band of the aphor. And they shall fasten the choshen by its rings to the band, sorry, by its rings to the rings of the aphor with a blue cord, so that it may be upon the band of the aphor and the choshen will not move off the aphor. It was basically secured by rings and chains and other sorts of bands. Thus, and all of these are important details. I don't mean to gloss over them, but honestly, a picture uh, is worth a thousand words. And um, we just need to pull up some pictures of this to see exactly what it looked like. Let's continue verse number 29. Thus, in other words, in such fashion shall Aaron carry the names of the sons of Israel in the Choshen of judgment over his heart. How beautiful. There's the names that he carries on his shoulders, he responsibility, but then there's the love, right? He carries also the names of the tribes above his heart, over his heart. 
when he enters the holy as a remembrance, once again, as a remembrance before the Lord at all times. And this really speaks to the two functions of a leader. Number one, responsibility, right? Leading and carrying the, you know, shouldering the responsibility for the people and lifting them up to where they, they can go and need to go. And that's a beautiful shoulder reference. But then there's the love and the compassion that the leader has for the people as well. And that is symbolized by a second instance of engraving the 12 tribes on stones. And that is the one that is worn directly over his heart on the breastplate. You shall place the Urim and the Tumim. Aha, what's that? The Urim and the Tumim into the Choshen of judgment so that they will be over Aaron's heart when he comes before the Lord. And Aaron will carry the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord at all times. Let's check out Rashi on that. What is the Urim and the Tumim? Rashi says, this refers to the inscription of the explicit name. Now that sounds maybe a little weird, but explicit name is not what you think it is. It refers to God's name that is typically not written out in full. So the inscription of God's name explicitly fully, no, um, no euphemisms, no redactions, no abbreviations, the full name of God it was written, inscribed, and then placed inside the Choshen. I, I mentioned that before. Remember, we said the Choshen was square folded. What was inside that fold? Imagine, I don't know, you take a piece of paper. It's not square when folded, right? So it's not a good piece of paper. But imagine, you know, folded, and then inside, right? Inside was tucked in the Urim and Tumim. What's the Urim and Tumim? God's name written out. So this refers, to, um, let's just read Rashi, this refers to the inscription of the explicit name, which Moses would place within the folds of the Choshen, through which it would light up its words, Meir, and perfect, me, I don't know, what's, what's over there? Oh, metamtem, its words. So he explains the, the phrase Urim and Tumim. Urim is like R, which is light. Tumim is like Tam, which is complete. So Urim and Tumim refers to what the inscription of God did for the Choshen. It lit up, it illuminated the stones when there was a question that needed to be answered. And it answered the question perfectly. Urim, it lit it up. And Tumim, it completed, perfected the response. The predictions up. Oh, take a look. I.e., the Urim and Tumim explain their words and their predictions never fail. Now, here's just a little bit of a, a fun fact. In the second temple, there was a Choshen. The high priest wore this breastplate because it was impossible for the Kohen Gadol to be missing any of the original garments. But that name of God, the Urim and Tumim, was not inside of it. Because of that name, it was called judgment. As it says, he shall inquire for him through the judgment of the Urim. That's what made the Choshen, the Choshen Mishpat. That's what made it the breastplate of judgment, that it had that, basically, that power. It was The Choshen was powered by that name of God that only existed in the Mishkan and the first temple, not in the second temple. So in the second temple, they had a Choshen, a breastplate, but it was not a Choshen Mishpat. It wasn't a Choshen of judgment because it didn't light up. It didn't have the name of God and therefore it didn't answer the questions. Ari, I've got a note on that if I'm going to read it. Yes, ready for it. Yeah, it says, uh, this is a divine name, which is generally forbidden to be uttered. Some maintain that it was not the Tetragamatron, that was the four letters of Hashem, but the 42-letter name. Uh, right. According to others, it was the 72-letter name. Right. Uh, Anyway, that's that's a note I have. Yes, and that's what I was alluding to before when I said it's not even, it's not it's it's not a euphemism, nor is it the abbreviated version. That would be the four letter name of God. It's the full deal that's typically never written out, certainly never uttered. But it was on on a note. I don't know, maybe parchment, whatever it was. It was written down and placed into the fold of the choshen of that breastplate, and that's what gave it its magical or divine answering abilities. I just want to explain, and then we're going to close it out for today, very quickly, to explain how it would answer. Basically, 
they the, the the high priest would ask God the question, so to speak, would 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 um, articulate the question, and then the stones would begin lighting up. Now, if you recall, the stones were engraved with the names of the tribes, which means that every stone had multiple letters on it. Are you with me? It's like a touch tone phone. Call one eight hundred Chabad in town, right? So like Chabad in town is not numbers. Yeah, but you look at your touch tone phone. And you're like, okay, where's the C? Boom, shakalaka. So this would be reverse engineering. This would be imagine if the digits on your touchstone phone lit up and you have to decode. Sorry, forget lighting up. Well, I mean, that would be cool also. But yeah, fine. Okay, imagine if they lit up and then you have to reverse engineer. Well, what's the message? And you're with me on why there could be multiple messages that you can, um, that you can cobble together from the same core digits. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Is anything what I'm saying making sense? I think not. Let me try again. Let me try one more time. So imagine you're looking at a touchstone phone and I tell you the phone number is 1-800-754-7723. What's the fancy, what's the name of the company? I, I'm giving you a random example. I don't know the answer, right? Obviously, I'm just doing this off the cuff. And you would look at seven, seven. I don't remember exactly what I said. Where you look at all those digits and each one has three three letters associated with it. And you would try to see, okay, what's the message? What's the name of this? But there are multiple options, some which will not make sense, some which may sort of make sense. Try to figure out, reverse engineer, what was the intention? Same thing is true with the high priest. The high priest would ask of, the, of, of God and the Urim Vatum would start lighting up and the sequence would lead the, the high priest to, to try to de de um, uh, decipher the answer, which was coded in the letters that were engraved upon those letters. Sorry, upon those stones. The code and the letters that were engraved on that stone. But if he's wearing it, how can he tell? Ah, he looks down. What do you mean? Maybe he had a mirror. Maybe someone took a, took a video of it, a, a TikTok video, and then he looked at it later. Whatever, there was a way. There was a method to figure this out, right? And it was a special chachma, divine inspiration, right? A divine spirit of prophecy almost that guided the high priest through the process of interpreting the lit up stones, right? Because the stones just lit up with multiple letters per stone. He had to figure out, well, what was the answer? What was the message? Either way, that's why it's called the Choshen Mishpah, not just the Choshen, but the Choshen of judgment, because it offered answers to the most difficult questions, which is kind of cool. You could use one of those. Today, we call it a Ouija board. But back then, they called, joking, Chas Vashon, right? Lahavdo. But then they called it a Choshen Mishpah. And the point that Rashi said, the second point is that in the second temple, didn't have that functionality. It had the outside, the choshen with the stones, with the engraving was there, but di didn't have the battery power, didn't have the, didn't have the juice for it to light up. All right, that's it for today. So what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is that our clothes help honor us. The, the, the kohanim that had holy work had to wear holy garments. And we discussed some of the significances of these garments. All right, that's it for today. Tomorrow, more priests. More garments, um, more ancient Jewish high fashion. Darling, who are you wearing? It's an original Moses. All right, that's it for today. Yeah, you, you knew I was going to break that out. There was no chance that it wasn't going to be broken out. We'll see you all. Have a wonderful day. Tonight, jewelry making with Donna. If you haven't gotten your kit yet and you want one, let me know. We got a few left. Otherwise... Tomorrow night, JLI, Purim Thursday night and Friday. Check your local listings, ChabadInTown.org, for all the details. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you all soon. You too. Thank you. All right. Pleasure. Great to see you, Mark and Ray and Donna. See you soon.